recent survey concluded 10 out of 10 people are going to die. <laughs> yes, it happens to all of us. But in my experience, most people don't want to think about it, talk about it, or make decisions about it. I've been in funeral world for the past 10 years, and it's made me realize just how ill-informed and inhibited we are about the most definite thing we all face. I'm standing here today because of my Aunt Rosie. I went to her natural burial on a cold but sunny November day in 2005. And like most people back then, I had never heard of natural burial. And like most people, I'd been to burial and cremations. And like most people, I'd never questioned why we do funerals the way we do. And there she was in her beautifully weaved willow coffin in the stunning English countryside. And it really did hit me. Why don't we do it this way? And of course, we have been doing it this way for thousands of years. It's just got a new name. Now that amazing and quite honestly life-changing moment led me to set up a nature reserve and natural burial ground in uh, 2012. So what's the difference between a natural burial ground and a consensual cemetery, Simon, I'm hearing you ask? Well, conventional cemeteries, this is a conventional cemetery, only have a single use. Their only purpose to exist is to be a cemetery. Whereas natural burial grounds have a dual purpose. In my case, a nature reserve. That purpose is the reason for it to be looked after long into the future. Let's look at a burial in a conventional cemetery. To maximise space, graves can be up to 12 feet deep for up to four burials in the same plot. In a natural burial ground, the graves are about three foot six inches deep and lined with hay. But increasingly and incredibly in conventional cemeteries, there's burials in concrete chambers. Can you imagine how much concrete? Well, figures are notoriously hard to come by. But according to the Barclays Planning Journal in the US, 1.6 million tonnes of concrete go into the ground every year. And every year, there's enough wood in the casket to build over 4 million American homes, plus thousands of tonnes of steel, copper and bronze. In a natural burial ground, coffins and shrouds are made of renewable materials, such as willow, carbon, bamboo, wool or cotton. Bodies are not embalmed and they're, made, and, and they're dressed in renewable uh, uh, clothes. My story is that 10 years ago, barren land that was strewn with rubbish was transformed into a 31-acre nature reserve with wild flower meadows, new native woodland, ponds, wetland, and hundreds of metres of hedgerow. It's now officially recognised for its, its, conserv its nature conservancy and its sustainability. In just 10 years, nearly a thousand different species of plants and wildlife have been recorded. Some of them on the red list of endangered species. Now, I realise I am not going to change everybody's mind about burial. Whether it's custom, religion, or just personal preferences, some people are going to choose cremation. Across the world, cremation is unfortunately in the majority.
and global projections for this year to 2022 are 61 million deaths. So finding ways of caring for our dead that are less harmful to the planet is a very real challenge. Challenges like the burning of fossil fuels. The energy equivalent of approximately a four to 500 mile car journey for each cremation. And then multiply that by upwards of 30 million cremations every year. There's also problems like the emissions of CO2 and nitrogen, nitrogen gases to the, uh, to the air. The treatment of carbon waste from chimney filters, if they've been fitted. And funeral pyres in countries like India using valuable and now diminishing supplies of wood as fuel. There are some positives. Electric cremators using renewable energy are now coming on stream. Uh, surgical implants can now be recovered and recycled, not reused, recycled. And uh, there's now water cremation coming on the stream. That is where an alkaline solution reduces the body to remain similar to that of flame cremation. But until these technologies are installed and fully supported with renewable energy, then cremation in its current guise isn't sustainable. Now, over the last 10 years, I've also considered why we do burials, how we do them, and what they mean to us. <coughs> Hands up. Who's been to their own funeral? <laughs> On our very first open day, I issued an invitation, come to my funeral. Just to show people what a natural burial might look like. I must say it was definitely a leap for me to see my nameplate on my willow coffin. And as it was our very first open day, my brother and sister, my, my, brother, my four brothers and my son and daughter were there. And as is often with families, I asked them to carry my coffin onto the horse-drawn cart. And we had a gentle procession through the meadow to an a cappella version of Swing Low, Sweet Chariot. And at Graveside, there was a violin piece by Boccherini welcomed us. My grave was open and my coffin placed on top. When we were all gathered, my coffin was lowered down onto the soft bed of hay. While my friend played the last post, a bit shakily, but definitely with feeling, and my daughter let a dove fly free. And the reactions? Well, my daughter, well, Dad, that was a bit weird, But two ladies came up to me afterwards and said, they gave me a huge hug, and with tears in their eyes, they said, thank you, Simon. That was a funeral for our mum. We never had. And that, something as remote, remotely personal as that had had that impact. And it made me realise then just how powerful a funeral ritual can be. And without one, we can perhaps carry on grieving for years, perhaps till the day we die. And so, some months later, I hosted an event called A Good Goodbye. And this is for three families that were still grieving. Uh, and among them was a 90-year-old lady called Pat, who was still grieving for her mum, Annie, who had died over four decades earlier and her brother, Richard, who had died some years before. Their funerals had been organised 
and controlled by an older sibling. So much so that Pat had felt totally disconnected from the ritual of both of their funerals. And on this day, she wrote and read a eulogy to both of them. And with tears running down her face, she placed her words with some mementos and photos into the ceremonial willow coffin. And after other families had done the same, they all helped to carry the coffin out, containing their precious memories onto the horse-drawn hay cart. We had a slow procession through the meadow to graveside, and Pat actually helped to lower the coffin down into the grave. And after a quiet reflection and some final words, there was a gentle ride back on the hay cart. The tears that Pat shed that day seemed to wash away her grief. And I've since spoken to her, and she said, that day, my grieving ended, as I'd finally laid the memory of my mum and my brother to rest. A funeral should not be a formality. A funeral should be fabulous and fulfilling, satisfying and gratifying. Outside of the constraints of a conventional funeral, families feel free to organise and have a funeral they want to remember in a place they don't want to forget. Take the Richards family, for example. Mum Rose and her two sons, Richard and Brian. They discussed their mum's funeral plans before she started palliative care in a local hospice. The two boys were with her when she died. And the hospice, who knew of the funeral plans, helped the boys prepare their mum for burial. No coffin. Just favorite, Rose's favourite quilt, tied with ribbon and covered with wild flowers. They brought their mum down to my nature reserve in the family estate car and carried her straight to grave. Three friends were also there. It was a simple but exquisite ceremony. A prayer a poem, and Rose's favourite pieces of music. The friends and her boys helped lower Rose's body into the grave onto the soft bed of hay. Laid to rest, planned, and so perfect. Now it's interesting, some families now enjoy a beautiful funeral at a natural burial ground after they've chosen cremation. Then the coffin will then go to the crematorium, often without the family. And then they'll return some days later with the cremated remains for a private and personal graveside service. Let me give you a story to illustrate that. My friend Caroline lived in Spain and she called me when she knew her father was dying. <coughs> As money was tight, she asked me if I would organise the funeral. So I ordered a cardboard coffin and duly collected him. With the help of the hospital staff, mortuary staff, I washed his body and wrapped him in a fresh cotton sheet and brought him down to my natural burial ground. There was just three of us in the chapel and when we were settled, I asked Caroline if she would like to see her dad for the very last time. She said, yes. So I gently removed the coffin lid and uncovered his face. And after a few quiet minutes, she gently kissed him goodbye. Caroline read a eulogy with some special memories for her and her dad. And the two friends quietly distributed uh, daffodils around his body 
And then I asked Caroline if she would like me to take a photo of her with her dad. And she looked at me and said, well, I said, you don't have to look at it. And after a few long moments, she agreed. After some final words and some hugs and tears, I covered his face, put the coffee lid on, and we made our way outside. His body then went for a cremation. The two friends said to me afterwards it was the most emotional and amazing funeral they had ever experienced. Hopefully now you will be aware of the differences and re remembering the, the survey, 10 out of 10 of us will die. You, know, you, you are aware that there are decisions to be made. And when making those decisions, please consider a natural burial. Natural burial is easy on the eye. It's kind to our hearts. And it's very gentle to our world. Thank you.